This video is a part of a series breaking down the key topics and lessons from our interview with Han Zhao, CEO of Gina AI. Please check out Semi Technologies on YouTube to see the full-length podcast, as well as a tutorial showing you how to integrate Weaviate and Gina AI for fashion image similarity search. There were so many interesting topics in my latest podcast with Han Zhao, the CEO of Gina AI, and I'm really excited to kick things off with describing full-stack neural search. So I've updated my thinking about what a full-stack neural search pipeline looks like and how these, this overall flow of deep learning for search looks like. So we start off with the new query flow. And before kind of diving into the details, the bird's eye view is that you have a pipeline, a flow for processing new queries. You have a flow for updating your document index with new data that you're adding to the uh, to the database. You have different encoders to put into your vector index. And you also might add, say, uh, content or symbolic filters onto these searches into your vector index. Then you have post-processing uh, filters after you are aggregating the embedding matchings from different granularities is in the way that you might decompose your query objects and your document objects. And this is a big lesson for me that, and hopefully for you too as well as we go through this. And I'm going to get into so much more detail in this immediately following this bird's eye view. And then you have the say application layer where you might add say supervised learning functionality like question answering, fact verification, named entity recognition onto the outputs of these uh, these match things in your document to the query. So let's get right into the details of this pre-processing and decomposing objects that we're searching through in these search pipelines. So we'll look at this idea of pre-processing these documents and decomposing them into data structures to have granular embeddings for a couple examples. First, let's look at a, an example of a text search. So say you're trying to search through this scientific paper, the lottery ticket hypothesis, and you would want to decompose this into different parts. So say you, you don't want to just have one embedding for all of this content, this 42 page uh, scientific paper. You don't want to have one embedding for this entire thing. Rather, what you might want to do is label it into introduction and then maybe have one embedding for this paragraph or have further embeddings for, say, these figures and embeddings for, say, these data, uh, data tables presenting the architecture in this paper. But you see how you wouldn't just want to have one embedding for this entire paper. You'd want to decompose it into some kind of data structure where you have granular embeddings. And then when you match your query, you match your query within this structure where you have some structure in the documents that you're storing. And then that comes down also into the post-processing where now that you have these granular embeddings, you're going to need a way to aggregate them and bubble them up maybe weight them with uh, different ensemble scores for different matchings. And this could be either, say, a weighting on the BM25 versus the DPR or SBIRT retrieval method with the vector encoding. And it could also be weightings for the different sections of the content. And this is highly application specific. And that's why a full stack framework helps you enable customization like this for your application. So as another example, let's look at some computer vision. Uh, this is taken from Keros code examples, object detection with RetinaNet. Uh, just to show the example of object detection. And so imagine you're doing an e-commerce product search and you want to look for the tennis racket. You don't want to have an embedding for this entire image. You might just want to have an embedding for this crop of the image. So you pre-process the images with object detection filters to separately get embeddings for each of the objects in the image. Similarly for say semantic segmentation, this is also taken from Keras code examples, multi-class semantic segmentation using deep lab uh, V3 plus. Imagine deep decomposing it into a uh, face and you have an embedding for just this region. I mean, this is this is more challenging to really put this into a deep neural network than say a bounding box window, which is really amenable to uh, the kind of the way that you process images in deep learning architectures. But just generally looking at this idea of segmenting images, breaking it down into the objects, the different categories, and having separate embeddings to search through the components. Say you have many different objects in the image, as Han describes. So you have a McDonald's menu, and you're just searching for uh, a burger, whereas the image contains a burger, fries, Coca-Cola, this whole idea. So hopefully that's a decent overview of this idea of pre-processing the query objects by decomposing the query into some kind of structure. So the query could be you are uploading a whole scientific paper and you're trying to find a, si a similar paper, or it could just be say an abstract. You have some way of decomposing the query object and chunking it into different segments that you might wanna have separate embeddings for each different segment, which you then hit with these vector indices. So with the update flow, you take the new document 
document, then you similarly pre-process the document with some kind of structure, and then you incrementally update the index. And that's what's important about, say, HNSW in our WeVA podcast with Yuri Malkov and Eddie and Dillocker, you can hear the uh, the importance of a vector index that you can update and how important that is for uh, database systems like the WeVA vector database and how that's different from some of these academic benchmarks in approximate nearest neighbor search at large scale, which to do billion scale search, they don't uh, anticipate being able to incrementally update the index compared to the HNSW algorithm implemented in WeVA. So uh, what you do, so then you have these different vector encodings. So for text, you have things like, say, TFIEF, BM25, Siamese, BERT, you know, dense passage retrieval. Images, you have, say, ResNet50, Efficient Net, Vision Transformer, different architectures. And then you have, say, image text models, like Clip is probably the most famous one, or Align. There's a lot of examples of these. But, and this is just kind of showing text image, image text, whereas you can imagine all sorts of things from audio, video models, uh, particular models for, say, biological sequences, or uh, maybe even you have an embedding model for tabular data, which I think is something that could be really interesting in exploring the uh, fusion between this kind of neurosymbolic search as you also do embeddings for tabular data as well as your symbolic filters on that tabular data. I think that could also be super powerful, but this is just kind of illustrating text, image, text, image, you could generalize that to any combination. So from there, we have our post-processing of the embedding matching. So as mentioned, say we decompose this archive paper into the different introduction-related works, experiments, tables, that kind of thing, and then we're matching it, and now we need some way to bubble up the embeddings matchings to overall filter out these similarity matchings and produce what, say, passes through the filter, as we imagine maybe you know, each each pass is like filtering out the documents through this. And then our application layer where we have maybe a re-ranking, recommendation system, question answering, fact verification, something that can maybe be easily tuned with say supervised learning, reinforcement learning, and, and put at the top of this stack. So hopefully this is a good diagram of these flows and understanding the different parts of what goes into a full stack neural search solution where you have your query, some way of processing your query, you might want to add uh, content or symbolic filters into the vector search. So you're kind of fusing the tr traditional way of search with symbolic filters with the new way of uh, vector dot product similarity search or however, whatever distance, whether it's Euclidean, whether it's some say pairwise scoring thing, however it's learned, whatever, however the distance metric is, but you're combining these two things. Then separately, you have a way of updating the vector index with new data for your uh, document store. And then you have a way of post-processing the embeddings, bubbling up the way that you've decomposed the structure of the object that you're uh, matching and then you have the high level application layer so you can imagine just disregarding this part the pre-processing as well as the document pre-processing and the post-processing of the granularity but this is something that a full stack solution enables you to add these components which is highly application specific so this is the key thing that's changed in my understanding of neural search from interviewing Han Zhao previously this was roughly my understanding of neural search and what I've failed to understand is the decomposition of queries and the documents into segmented units and we're going to talk more about that later again as Han gets into more detail about, say, using object detection to separate images into the objects in the images and then have embedding separately for each object in the image. But this is a key detail that I've been missing out on is this idea of how you segment and decompose queries and the documents in the index to enable more fine-grained and more accurate embedding search. So to kind of recap and preview the upcoming chapter breakdown of the podcast with Han Zhao, to answer what is Gina AI, it's a neural search pipeline for the full stack neural search solution. And this enables the flexibility to add all these fine-grained components like a pre-processing object decomposition for the queries and the documents, as well as how this fits into the doc array data structure, which is an, an elegant data structure for organizing this kind of decomposition where you can uh, you know, segment it into documents, sub-document, sub-document, and then you can also match along the sub-documents to enable that kind of fine-grained search. And then there's the embedding storage, the uh, Weaviate side of things with the, with the way that you store these embeddings. And then there is the post-processing with aggregating the embeddings. And you can think of post-processing as also, say, the read stage of retrieve then read, some way of, say, retrieval fusion, re-ranking the ways of combining the different ways of whether it's uh, you need to combine it because of the granularity of how you decompose the query in the uh, in the documents and how you're doing the matching or if it's pro post processing with respect to say answering a question on the return documents something like that kind of makes up this full stack end-to-end -end neural search so Gina AI as we'll talk about in the podcast has some additional components that are extremely interesting we've talked a lot on this podcast about 
Uh, the idea of having, say, one embedding model for all domains, there's a great paper that is titled Don't Stop Pre-Training that shows the importance of continuing to optimize the models within the data domain that they're going to be applied in. So, for example, if you have uh, GPT-3 or maybe even a smaller model, because at the larger scale, I think it's more confusing how the models behave, but at, at something like a billion scale model, if you're f training it on all the web text compared to just biomedical papers and your downstream supervised learning task is in the biomedical paper domain, it's important to fine tune it in biomedical papers. So Gina AI implements some things that help with fine tuning, like a, an active learning labeling user interface, and as well as a network tailor. There's a recent paper called Clip Adapt or some title like that, where uh, the researchers from mostly the University of North Carolina, I think, are they're able to fine tune Clip only using 4% of the original parameters of Clip. So that's kind of the idea of network tailor, uh, this idea of having these sparse adapter layers that you can fine tune a model for your domain without really needing to fine tune the entire model architecture and all the weights in these massive models. And then the Gina AI, they have something called Gina Hub, which is a marketplace of these pieces, such an interesting component as we'll get into more in this series. So with that, this is a quick overview of Gina AI. Now here's from Han Zhao and his uh, quick overview of Gina AI before we get into all the details of this. So to kick things off, Han, thank you so much for uh, coming on the podcast. And could you tell us a bit about what Gina is about? Hi, hey, Connor. Thanks for having me. Uh, and uh, really glad to talk to you and uh, also to the Viviat community. And uh, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Han. I'm the founder and the CEO of Gina AI. And uh, uh, so Gina AI is a pretty new company. We founded in February in 2020 during pandemic. And over the last year, we have been building the new research uh, pipelines, the full stack solution, uh, uh, including uh, the framework itself, but also including the data structure, the fine tuning, uh, and also the uh, kind of marketplace underneath. Right? So that's that's right now. So uh, right now we have 45 people over the world. Our headquarters is based is in Berlin. And right now I'm sitting in my Berlin office, <laughs> enjoying the raining day here and, uh, uh, you know, complaining about the weather uh, and, uh, you know, making pool requests. Right. So that's that's kind of my daily work. <laughs>